at this point, what we're going to be doing in our tutorials is starting to look at vector-based shapes inside of Photoshop. That's right, vector-based shapes inside of Photoshop. That's correct. Not just available in Illustrator. And in fact, since CS2, you were able to work with vector-based shapes in Photoshop. Here we are with shapes in CS3. And everything that we're going to be seeing here is applicable to CS2 as well. So in order to access your vector-based shapes, um, you can do so right here with this tool. First of all, you'll see it called the Rectangle Tool. And what I'd like to do at this point is just have you recognize that everything that belongs inside of this little square, notice how it's been uh, delineated from the other ones. And that is because all of these sets of tools are used specifically for vectors and vector-based shapes. That's right. So the type tool being vector-based shapes, of course it is. That's why you have to rasterize type before you can actually do anything with filters or any other sort of effects. Um, so you might be asking, what is a vector and why is it different from uh, the regular tools inside of Photoshop? Well, let me do something to explain that in this first little exercise here. And what I'd have you do is to recognize that, number one, first and foremost, uh, Photoshop is a bitmap editing software. And it has been traditionally for many years. But since CS2, some vector-based tools were introduced. Main difference being is, when you look at a photograph, you're going to be seeing that photograph um, if you zoom in on it, being composed of a bunch of little pixels. In fact, traditionally what you would do inside of uh, Photoshop in the past to create a uh, circle, as you can see here, I'm just going to hold shift and make a perfect selection. It's a little selection like this. And if I were to just drop in some of my uh, tools, here's the paint bucket tool. So inside that, control D to deselect. Notice it looks a little chunky, and that's because I'm not at 100%. So I'm going to use the shortcut, Control, Option, or Alt, and 0. And that off not only just fits it into the screen, but it actually, more appropriately, sets it to the optimum size of 100%. Anyways, as you can see here, this looks great. There's nothing wrong with that. It's perfectly round, and it looks wonderful. Notice also that I tried to move it, but I had accidentally uh, drawn it on the background layer, so I can't move any of that because it's locked. Yet another disadvantage to doing it in that fashion. Let me just run through that again. I'll just go through my undo steps. And for those of you who don't remember our previous tutorial, that is Control-Alt-Z or Apple-Alt-Z on a Macintosh. And um, in the past, what you would more appropriately do is to create a new layer and then take your selection holding shift to make it perfectly round and fill it with a color control D command D to deselect and now I've got an object that I can move around okay well that's perfectly fine there's nothing wrong with that however look what happens if I try to increase the size of this pixel based or raster based shape uh, control T brings up my free transform tool and if I make this bigger, actually, hold on a second. Um, just by holding shift, right? You'll notice that as I do, the edges get all blurred and they don't look very good. Notice, I'll undo that again and I'll show it to you. That got a little skewed the first time, so let me do that again for you. And notice I'm holding shift to keep this constrained. So as I increase that in size, notice how that looks not really all that great. It's all blurred and it's pixelated and it doesn't look great. So that's a distinct disadvantage to working with something when it's a pixel based shape, whether it's a photograph or whether it's selection that's been increased. So now at this point, I'll demonstrate that if we were going to do the same thing with a vector shape tool, and notice what I'm doing here. I'm just drawing this shape out. There's going to be more on this in the next tutorial. This is just a brief understanding. You'll see that it's got this ugly sort of circle effect on it right now. But as soon as we take the Move tool and select a background, you'll notice that that's super crisp and really, really looking good. Um, let me show you what happens when we blow this up. As big or perhaps even bigger than my previous shape, you'll notice that despite being a huge size, as we can see here. Notice the difference between the vector-based shape and notice the difference between 
this shape as well. It's decidedly different. The vector base shape, because it's mathematically created and calculated, it maintains its shape and it maintains the consistency of that shape and it doesn't get uh, all distorted when you increase it in size. Here's something else. Now if you remember, I just went back a few steps, Control-Alt-Z uh, or Command-Alt-Z on the Mac, and as you can see here, this is my bitmap object, same as it was before. Look what happens if I wanted to change the color of this object. If I was to come in here and say, hey, now all of a sudden I want it to be green. I come in here and I do this. Even without increasing this in size, I don't know if you can see it. It's rather small right now, but you'll notice that it did get chunky. It doesn't look very good at all. On the other hand, notice this. If I were to start with a vector base shape, and you see here it looks good, it's green, but that's because we started it as green. Um, now to change this shape's color, take a look at this. This little box here on the shape layer allows you to double click it and choose a completely different color. Beautiful, it looks very sharp, it's crisp. Not, no, none of the problems that we have when we um, try to drop in some color on something that's a bitmap image. So that looks really great. The anti-alias is crisp. It looks wonderful. So therein lies a little bit between the differences of the two, and we'll talk more about this in the next tutorial.